Hey there everybody and welcome back. So this is the next video in the playlist where we're going to get down into the fun part, which is actually building out the social and sharing element of this application. So at this point, basically, we're going to be connecting this with a database and sharing information. Now, before we get started, this login screen we've already created in previous videos. If you don't know how we got here, check out the previous videos for creating the sign up and sign in page. At this point, we have this login page and a home page. Here, you're able to log into the app. It does not require authentication, so a user can sign in with any email address. They don't need to log in and verify by clicking on that link. Um, if you want to learn more about the security rules, I provided resources in the previous videos where I we made the sign in and login page. Um, so if you want to learn more, check out those resources. For now, we're just going to let a user sign up with an email address, even if it's not theirs, just because we're making this bare bones. So let's jump in. Now, first thing, we have this image up here that doesn't actually have a resource tied to it. There's no image. So uh, we want to make this more appealing. So you can add as many images as you want. I do not recommend, at least for this part, hard coding it into the app. So what I mean by that is if you were to click here, and upload an actual image, then you're gonna run the risk of it actually being built into the app and then you can't change it. So maybe you wanna change it for something seasonal, let's just say Christmas. You wanna add in a Christmas image. You're going to have to release an update instead of just changing a URL in the back end. So let's walk through that now because that's also gonna be foundational for other parts of the application. So to get started, to add a data resource, you go up here and you click on data. You click add data resource. And interestingly enough, this Google Firebase and Firestore is not what we're going to be using, only because the previous application I made was with this REST API direct integration, as this Firebase option was not available at the time. That's a little bit newer for Firebase. You can find resources online for that if you're interested. But I also like this method because it shows you how to do this if you're using a data resource that's not Firebase. So you can use other databases as well as long as they follow security guidelines and everything else and the rules and structures here. So it's pretty simple to do this. We're going to type in a resource ID. I love consistency, so we're going to type app images. When it says short description, we're just going to put images for the app. The resource URL we're going to have to create now. So let's go over to Firebase. And we are essentially going to click on our for the YouTube. Again, you can make your project whatever you want it to be. We'll click on Firestore database. Now, when you click it for the first time, it may ask, do you want to create your Firestore database? You'll click create. It'll say that it's going to provision it. And then it'll ask essentially if you want it to be public or for testing. I added mine for public just because I really plan on deleting this afterwards, but you can set it up as testing and then change your security rules later if you want. Uh, the resource in the previous videos provides some additional securing endpoint options, so check that out. Now for this, we're gonna go ahead and click on Start Collection. And again, I love consistency, so we're gonna call it App Images so we don't get lost or forget what it is. This is not the best naming convention, but I'm gonna name the document App Images as well. We're gonna add a couple of fields and this will all make sense in a second. I'm going a little quickly just to show you how it'll uh, translate over. So here we're going to put login. Here we will just put image two. You can name these whatever you want. This will be image three. And then this is the value. So this is the URL. So I'm going to go over to Unsplash. I highly recommend this for anyone looking for good images. Uh, they're excellent, high quality images. A couple of things, make sure that you're checking the images you're using to make sure that you're using something that is free for commercial use. And when you can give a shout out to the individuals publishing the content, uh, definitely know it's helpful to them. So we're going to right click the image and we're going to click copy image address. The reason we do this is we need the address for this image specifically, not for this in this URL because this is this entire page. So if you're going to use an image, always make sure you can use it for commercial use and you're not violating any rules or policies. Now we're going to go over to Firebase and we're going to paste in that URL. And here, just so we can kind of keep things straightened out and kind of making sense, we're going to put image two and then image three. And we're just going to click save. Now you'll see we have the collection, the document, and all of the fields. So at this point, we're going to go to Docs, so you can click here and bring up your Firebase documentation, and you can search for this. So use the Cloud Firestore REST API. We're going to scroll down just a tad, and we're looking for to interact with this path, combine it with the base API URL. So we'll break this down together right now. We need this base part right here. 
So up until v1 slash, so right click, click copy, and we're just basically copying this portion here. So we're going to go over here, and in that resource URL, we'll paste that. And then in the get collection, uh, so what we'll do is we actually need to go back and just cut off that dash. So um, what we're going to do now is now we need the rest of the URL. So we can go over to the documentation, and we're going to copy the slash over this time, and we'll copy this, and we're going to paste it in, and now we have a couple edits to make. So first it's going to say your project ID. Now when you're logged into your Firestore, you'll see up here it says it has a URL and it'll say project slash. If you'll notice, I made my name for the YouTube, but they changed it just a tad. So we're going to copy this part right here just after project. So what's in between these two dashed lines. So basically, you're just copying your project name. So see how it's for the YouTube? This is what that's translating to in the URL. And then we're going to paste it in right here. And then you see slash databases slash default slash documents. That's all correct. All we need to do is name the document that we're pulling up. So we're going to put app images. Now, before we do anything further, one thing I want to make sure that you're aware of, because this can hang up a lot of people here. Uh, so if you put yours to public, by default, there are going to be rules in place in Firestore. So you'll see these rules here. You'll see allow read and write if false. This means no one can read and write to it. It's just locked down completely. It's a great thing to know in the event that you have any issues or security related problems that you can just lock everyone out with a couple words. So what we're gonna do to make this public, which means anyone can modify, read, write, etc. I don't recommend this if your app has any kind of sensitive info whatsoever. Mine is designed to be more of like an open source, anyone can do what they want kind of application. So without security rules, just to make this completely open, you just delete this line here. I would recommend making a note of this because you can add that back at any time. And we're just going to click publish. You'll see it gives you this warning, and that's because I set mine to be open. So it's saying anyone can steal it. That's fine for this. And then we're going to go back to the Firestore database. So we published that, so now we can actually edit this. If you don't do that, and you're uh, depending on what the settings are in your testing mode or public, you could run the risk of never being able to read or write to it, and it's going to get really confusing when you constantly get error messages. So we've added this URL here. Now let's go to response key path, and we're just going to tell AppGyver, hey, this is a document. So put in the word documents, plural. Go to test, and we're going to click on run test. Now, if this looks confusing at all, don't worry about it. This is what we're going to set a schema from. So this is the response. When we navigated to that URL, which you can actually do on your own if you're interested. So we're going to copy this, and we're going to go in here to where this URL is. This is just something I want you all to see. So let's create this URL ourselves. So this is basically the exact same thing we just pasted in. If you hit enter, you'll see this is the actual web page that we go to. So what AppGyver's done is they've basically done a get request and said, hey, what's at this URL? And then it's showing that we have image three, image two, and login. So we're going to go ahead and set schema from response. And then you'll see it's set up all these fields. So now we can actually tell what goes where. And we're just going to click on save. Now, we can go back to our login page. And now we're going to go to variables. And we're going to go to data variables. And we're going to add a data variable. And you'll see we now have one here called app images. And we can just click save. Now, this app images variable, you don't need to rename it, adds a one by default. Now we have access to that information on this page. So what do we do now? We can click on image down here. If yours disappeared, it's just because there's no content. We'll click on source. We're going to go to data and variables. And then you'll see we have some options here. We're going to go to data variable. And we don't have the ability to select anything right now. So what we will actually need to do for this is we're going to go ahead and create a formula. So here, 
we're going to backspace everything and we're going to put data and you'll see we have let's see so when you go down you'll see data app images fields login string value and then if you click this you'll see over here the example of what that value is so what we're basically telling this to do is pull in the value the string value for that login item and we'll click OK and we'll click Save and now we have an image here and here's what I want to show you that's really really important about this when we save this we're gonna go ahead and go to launch and we're gonna to go to distribute and we're gonna go actually we're gonna to go to preview I apologize now when we open this page we're gonna open it and it, the web preview will have a larger image. We're just gonna right click and click inspect so that we can use the developer tool. And this is what it's gonna look like on a mobile browser. Ignore everything over here on the right. So this is what the application would look like. Now what I love about this is now if we were to publish this to Google Play, let's decide, you know what? This wasn't the image we wanted. We actually wanted some coffee beans. We can right click and click copy image address. And we can go over to our Firestore database, even after users have already downloaded this, paste in the new URL and click update. And then what we essentially do from here is just wait. And then when the page refreshes, that image changes. So like I said, the image does not need to be hard coded to the app. And you can do this for all of your app images, which make things a lot easier for you. And it also makes your app much smaller. These images, especially high quality images, are very large in size and take up a ton of space. So we have now added a data resource to enable us to add an image to our login page. Now we're gonna use this data resource to go into a little bit more detail and create a couple pages. So let's go ahead and go to add new page. And let's just say you wanna make something a little bit with a little bit more of a social element. We're gonna type in forum. And then we're going to go to OK. Now at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to get started actually creating a forum page. So I don't know what your styling is going to look like. So if you want to pause here and kind of change the content, uh, let's just say, see what other users. Actually, let's change that. And here we'll just put forum. And then we will go to style, dimensions and position. And let's see what we can do here. We will go ahead and align this to the center. And then here we can put in, let's just say, see what other users are saying. And then at this point, we probably want to align this up in the center as well. Again, no idea how you want yours to look, but just so you can kind of see it. So now what we can do is if you want, you can make this page look a little bit better. For example, you could drag over a card, have a background image, put a little bit more of like an introduction into what the forum is going to look like. So on my forum page on this application, we'll go click on login. These are all the pages I had. We'll just go to this general forum. And you'll see what I did was I created multiple forums and essentially they're all linked to a card. So what you could do if you're interested to follow that app, you can set up different forums for different topics. So let's add in another card. So here you could have forum one and then you could have forum two and you could put details here. And then you go over here and you go details here and these you can link to another page. So we'll click save. And then up here, we are going to go create another page for this to actually link to. If you just want one forum, that's fine. But I do think that the forums can get pretty crowded. So it's better to kind of separate things. And honestly, most websites are like this already. So we'll go to forums and add a new page and we'll make this forum one and click save and save here. Now we can go back to our forums page and click forum one. And now we get to use logic again. So we'll click on the show button logic or the show logic for the card.
And over here, we are going to drag over open page. You can click the node here and drag over to navigation. And then we will click on this little flow function here and click on the page. And we're going to open up forum one and click save. And we will now save this. So now once users pull up this page, they decide, you know what, forum one is where I wanna post. They will just click on this and it will automatically open up that corresponding forum here. So let's build this one out. So we will go ahead and type out forum one. If you don't want this here, you can enable headers uh, from this navigation menu. I like to type my own out, so I don't really like that enabled by default because you don't get to choose as much of the styling there. So we can adjust any settings here. I'm just gonna go ahead and go to dimensions and position and I will center this. And then here we're just going to say, here is a summary of the forum. And you can set this up however you want. Again, feel free to mess with adding in some of these different components to make it look the way that you want it to look. And then we will save just to make sure that everything's up to date. And now we are going to actually build out this forum. So. This is the tricky part because you have to figure out what you want it to look like. So using mine as an example, my first forum is a coffee, let's see, what was it? It was a coffee roasting forum. So we can go into this application and we're gonna look through all of these different options. So we see coffee roasting forum here. So this is what I made mine look like. It's just gonna say all things roasting. And then these fields are what you want users to actually be able to display. So the idea here is what's your post about? What's on your mind? What are the actual thoughts? And then who's posting this content? And when they click right on the wall, all the posts appear here. And then if you click on that post, it'll actually pull up that in an individual page. So what we need to do to get started is figure out where is all of this actually going? So what we can do here is we are going to look at the logic for this button just to kind of show you how it relates to what we did earlier. So this is actually doing some similar if statements to make sure that there's content here. And then a data request, which is basically saying post this information to a given page. So now we are going to go over here to this forum and we are going to add in our input field. So let's say we're going to add two input fields. The first one is going to be, say, name. And then we're gonna need to create some values for this in a second one, or in a second. And the second one is gonna be description. And then the last one will be, let's just say we'll add in one for who's posting. This will allow people to have like a screen name. So we're gonna add in the variables here. So we're gonna add a page variable by clicking on this little slider up here. Add variable, I love standard naming conventions, so we'll go with name and then description. And we'll stray a little bit here and just put poster and save. And as we did before, you'll see that we can now tie those variables to these input fields. So we're gonna click on value for the first one data and variables. We're going to go over to page variable and we'll choose name and then what's and here is where we're setting a preview value. So this is basically telling users what goes here because they may think this is their name. So we'll put what's this post called and then save and then we'll go here to description and we will put value and we'll go ahead and we'll click on data variables and we will do a page variable and we'll put description and we'll put what's on your mind and then you'll click save and then who's posting so this will be data variable and as i'm sure you guessed by now this is poster and then you'll put what's your name and now we have our three data fields with the variables that represent the inf information the user enters. Next up, we're gonna click a button 
or add a button because we actually need to send this information. So at this point, we will name this post on the wall, but you can call it whatever you think is relevant or whatever makes sense for your users. So at this point, we have all the information we need, and now we're going to go ahead and set up this button. So we need to set up an HTTP request, but we also want to make sure people can't post without having information in all of these fields. So let's check the logic that we have over here. So if we look, this is my coffee, uh, all things coffee roasting forum page. So I'm going to click on right on the wall. I'm going to show the logic and we'll see what logic we have set up for this. So we have if name, if name and if name, and these are basically making sure there's information here. And then the toast messages basically saying, add a name, add a description, add a fake name. So we will go ahead and add these in, and I'm gonna go over here, click post on the wall, and we will go ahead and scroll over here and add an if condition, add another if condition, And sometimes when you're dragging these over, it's not always the most friendly when you're trying to move too quickly. All right, so we have our three if conditions. And then we're going to want to add in our toast messages as well. So we're going to scroll up, add one here, one here, and one here. And then we are going to add our HTTP request as well. I like to add all these and so we can go through the flow together. So let's go ahead and kind of connect everything just to make things make sense. So if there's no name, we're gonna connect the bottom node to this dialog. If there's no description, we'll click the bottom node and attach it to our dialog, which will basically say, add a description, and then lastly, if they don't tell you who's posting, we'll give them another, another notification. And then, if all of that's present, we're going to do this data request. The last thing to do is connect these options to each other, and now we just need to essentially develop the logic. So we're going to go over here and see what I have typed up. So this first one, if we check on the formula, you can basically see all we've done is add in this not is empty page bar name. Let's check the next one and see if it's any different. It's the same thing, but description. And then the next one is the same. So we're not validating the type of content, just making sure that there's something there. So we'll click on this first condition. We'll click on the button that looks like a little toggle. We'll type in a formula. And I'm just going to paste it in because I have it right here and I can kind of cheat a little bit. Now you'll notice I get a little red mark right there and that's because my page variable is capitalized. So these are case sensitive. So in case you need to type this out, it's not in all caps, open parentheses, is in all caps, underscore empty, all caps, open parentheses, and this is where you type in that page vars with a capital V dot name. And this is whatever your page variable is, and then close parentheses, close parentheses, and we'll just click save. Now, if you ever need to remember your page variables, you have the options here. So you can just click this, double click your variable, and it'll insert it in. And we're just gonna save it once you've closed off those parentheses. And then we're gonna do the same thing here, but first we're gonna change this dialog menu, enter a name. Now we're gonna go to this one, click the condition, click formula, and we are going to paste it in again, but this time the page variable is going to be the description. And we're just gonna click save. And then we will move this over a tad. Down here, we will put enter a description. And then here is our last condition, and this is going to be the last page variable that we have yet to use, which is poster. And then here we will just put enter your name. And then we're gonna go ahead and generate this API request. 
So we're going to look at what I have set up on mine. So you'll click here and you'll see we have a URL that we're posting to. So we're going to need to set up a data resource. We have an HTTP method as post and we have a request body as well. So we're going to need to go ahead and get this set up. Now the header you don't need. This is part of something else that's a little bit unrelated. It's about like securing endpoints. What we do need is the request body. So we need to figure out how to get this set up in Firebase. So let's go ahead and jump over to our Firebase account. Click Start Collection. And here we'll put Forum 1. And I'll just name it Forum 1 again. And here we'll put Name, Description, and Poster. The reason I'm making these the same is once you start creating multiple forums back to back to back, it's incredibly difficult to remember what goes where. So once you start copying and pasting logic, it's going to make things a lot more confusing. So here we will put name. Let's go ahead and put Tyler. Description. Put what's up with a question mark and poster. Actually, sorry. This should be, let's put hey. And then the poster will be Tyler. And we'll click Save. And now you'll see we have a new collection here. So we're going to go ahead and jump on over to our application itself. So we'll close that. And we're going to do this data request. So we're going to go to Data. And if you remember, we already have one data resource, but now we have to add another. So what I like to do to make things a little shorter here is I copy this and I paste it up here and then I click off and I copy this and then I make sure my cursor is all the way over and then I cut the whole thing. So that's the URL for this data resource. So now what we're going to do is we're going to add a new data resource, REST API Direct Integration, and this will be Forum 1. And in the description, honestly, we just put the same thing. And we're going to paste in that URL. And then what we're going to do here is cut off the last part so it's slash v1, just like it was before. We'll go over to get record, and we'll paste in the remaining. And then here, the only thing that we changed is the last part. And instead of app images, it's forum1. Down here, as we did before, we're going to put documents. And we're going to put test run test. You'll see we have all the information here, which is great. So we're going to set schema from response. One thing I want you all to know is if at any point you make a data resource, so like this we have here, and let's just say you decide uh, later on I forgot, you know what, I really needed a fourth field. If you just go change it in Firebase, it's not going to change within AppGyver. That This setting schema from response, you're going to need to do any time you add or remove those fields to reduce any issues or potential errors. So how we just click save right here because we've set a schema from the response. If we decided to go back in here and add another field, we would just repeat what we just did. So we would just go to the Git tab, go to test, run test, and then set schema from response, and then all the new information would be recorded. So we're going to close out of here now that we've saved everything. And it's time to do a post request. So you'll see in the URL box, what we're going to do is copy what we've already done on this end over here. So you'll see we have our URL typed in just like it was previously. So we can actually pretty much copy everything over. So we are going to go here in URL. We will click and put formula. And in this double quote section, we are actually going to copy that. And since I didn't grab the first part of the URL, we can just go back to our documentation and grab that here. So we are telling this <clears throat> where to send the information. So we'll type out that URL and click Save. We are going to post, not get. And then you'll see optional inputs. Now, here's where it's going to get a little tricky because we need to make sure that we are setting this up as an actual post request. 
So in optional inputs, we're not worried about headers, but we are worried about the request body and make sure the request body type is JSON. So we're gonna go over here and see what my request body looks like for this application. So we'll click on the formula. And just to kind of explain what this looks like, this is, if you remember the information, if we typed this URL out and pasted it into the web browser, it's gonna bring up something like this. So we have to tell Firebase where this information goes. So we're gonna copy this over, but I'm gonna kind of walk you through what everything looks like real quick. So we'll jump over to our application. And again, we've just clicked on request body. We're gonna type in formula, and then we're going to paste it in. So what we have here, everything is encased by double brackets, or by uh, curly brackets. So it's curly bracket open, and then fields in double quotes with a semicolon and a space. And then there's this formatting. So you have a curly bracket and four spaces, and then you have in double quotes, name, semicolon space, and it's, or it's four spaces or so again, and then you'll see the string value, page var's name. So to help this make a little bit more sense to you, I wanna show you where this information is coming from. So we're gonna paste, or we're gonna copy this URL here, go into a new tab and paste it, and this is where this information is coming from. So this should look familiar. So you'll see we have fields, all of this information, all the way up until this, essentially like this final bracket. So if we, if you were to copy this, this should copy over almost everything exactly as you need it. So we'll copy this. This is what's currently stored in Firebase. And what you're gonna be doing in AppGyver is basically saying this login field, I want the string value to be, and instead of it being what it already is, we're posting information. So this section right here is gonna be the page variable that is whatever the user enters. The same thing with this right here, it's going to be the, whatever the user enters. Now this is for the app images document. So if we wanna change this out to make it make a little bit more sense, we'll just put forum one. So you'll see, we're going to be copying this information here all the way down to this comma. So this is what's going over. So we're gonna change the HTTP request here because I realized I didn't change that to forum one and click on save. And then in the headers, we don't need to add anything, but you would add if you need to add security or securing endpoints. And then here we're gonna to go to formula and in brackets, we will paste in what we just copied over. Now, what you're gonna notice is this looks almost identical to what we have here. So we're just gonna make sure that we're jumping back and forth and kind of validating everything. Now you'll notice one thing that's different here is these values here are the page variables. So we're gonna jump over here, and for poster, we're going to put in parentheses page, and we can actually remove this, because when it's in quotes, it's gonna treat it as a string value. So if you'll see over here, there are no quotes. So we will put right here page variables, poster, and description, we will go over here and remove what's in quotes. And we're gonna to go to page variables and put description. And then here where it says string value, we're gonna put, so mine's actually acting up a little bit. So let me, sometimes when you're working with the formula too much, things will get changed up a little bit, unfortunately, and it'll start backspacing in the wrong direction. So I'm just gonna paste everything in and change the names. But what I was doing, you shouldn't have that issue. Again, sometimes it'll backspace in the wrong direction. So all we're doing here is updating the page variables. And here's what it's gonna end up looking like when you're done. 
So this one is going to be poster. So when you've copied that information over, you'll see you have field name and then encased in brackets is string value with a page variable. Don't put this in quotes. It's pulling that value, not the string value that relates to the actual text. Then description, same thing, and poster, page var poster. And we will click save. So now we've basically told this what to send. So we're going to click save here. And let's go ahead and test this out real quick. So we can go ahead and we will go to launch, open app preview portal, and we're going to click on open. And again, we'll right click and click on inspect. Now, we're at the login page right now. If you get annoyed by having to constantly log in, one option that we have is we can go to the off page um, so choose initial view. We can actually just change this to forum one. And then this way, when we refresh this, it's going to bring up the page that we were just working on, and we'll just go back to the authentication later. So for name, we can type in hey2. Description will be what's up again. And then who's posting? We'll put Tyler 2 and post on wall. And when we go over to this forum here and I clicked it twice, you'll see that we have what's up again, hey 2, Tyler 2. So this stuff updates almost in real time. So we'll just add in Tyler 3 and click post. You'll see now we have a new document, so Tyler 3. So this keeps adding documents, so the posting has worked. So now we have actually created the forum page and users can now send their information to this wall, so to speak. So now we need to figure out how do we actually display this information. So since we've kind of covered a lot for now, we'll do that in the next video, but this is a great stopping point. Check out the next video in this playlist where we're going to actually display this information for users to view. I'll see you all there.